this little Roman mythology for you today. So we're going to just say a few words about Roman myths in Roman religion, or at least beginnings, key concepts, Roman myths, of course, as the heart and soul of today, and discerning through all of it, what is truly Roman? And the scholarship has always wrestled with this. Students of ancient Roman religion are wrestling with this. We're still wrestling with it today. I am wrestling with it. What is truly Roman? Uh, so we will look at Greek influence, outside influence, but ultimately we'll see that the stories that are transmitted to us, uh, the artwork that is preserved, is gonna focus on specific locations. So why Roman topography matters is really what it's all about. Today, there's a scene already in the first slide here with uh, Curtius who is sacrificing himself by jumping into um, a gaping chasm uh, that appears in what will be the Roman Forum, the time maybe as far back as Romulus, and that self-sacrifice. Those are the kinds of stories that are transmitted through these stories to the people of Rome, to the school children, from father to son, from mother to daughter. It's all about sacrificing yourself on behalf of the state. So let's uh, get into it. Let's start in the beginning. Uh, uh, one second. <laughs> somebody's somebody's birth. Hey. Whoa. Ah. Okay. Hello. Okay. Keep calm, dog. Nemi. You can follow Nemi, Nemi in Rome. Of course, you can follow me at uh, Dari, sorry, Diggs. You can follow the Institute at Save Rome on Twitter and Facebook and uh, Instagram. And we're having a great time sharing all this new material that we are uh, creating. And we're happy then to bring you, here you have City Foundation. We're talking about the earliest beginnings of Rome. You see uh, the bottom left fresco comes from Plaza Massimo, which is part of Museo Nazionale Romano. I just met last week with the new director who is wonderful. And we know that we're gonna be going back time and time again to the National Museums of Rome. There are four locations and they have amazing uh, materials. So there's the She-Wolf with the twins from the Capitoline Museum. And Museo Nazionale Romano, we wanna help it be as well known as the Capitoline Museums because the collection is in no way inferior. So Vatican Museums, uh, Capitoline Museums, we wanna help put on the map as much as possible the incredible artifacts that are in the national collection in four locations, including Plaza Massimo. Okay, so the myths, Romulus's origins. How do we tell this story? Let's look at the art. So we have the bronze she-wolf from the Capline Museums. We have a Republican coin. We have a wall painting in the center from Pompeii. The man floating in the sky in his armor is Mars, descending upon Rhea Silvia that he falls in love with. And she then gives birth to twins. So they are sons of a mortal and an immortal, but specifically, Rhea Silvia or Silvia is the descendant of Romulus and Remus. So we're tying back to uh, what we call the Trojan cycle, which gets into Greek myths. And that's how the Romans saw themselves as tapping into those great stories, those great achievements, that great culture, but not being Greek, being something different. They then, in their stories, associated themselves with the Trojans that escaped the destruction of Troy, namely Aeneas, who was the son of Aphrodite. So he's a demigod as well. So you have then flowing through the veins of Romulus and Remus, both the blood of uh, Aphrodite and the blood of Mars. And that's gonna be another uh, reason why Rome is gonna be so successful, uh, is that you have uh, gods overseeing and being part of that lineage. Uh, they're, disco they're discovered by shepherds when the twins are abandoned. And that very rare fresco that comes from a tomb uh, near, well, let's say the um, Porto Maggiore area, 
The bottom left image shows the twins being abandoned, kind of like uh, putting Moses in a basket and floating down the Nile. Here are Romulus and Remus put in a basket and floated down the Tiber, who is represented as a reclining male figure. Uh, that's a typical way to depict uh, a river. In the bottom right-hand corner, an altar from Palazzo Massimo as well, is depicting the shepherds that come across the abandoned twins who have washed ashore what will be Rome, and they're being suckled by a she-wolf, this miracle, right? This uh, goddess, uh, the, 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 the she-wolf is, of course, going to be sacred to Mars. Mars sends them so the kids don't uh, die from exposure. So I think we're familiar to a degree with this particular myth. City foundation, uh, more myths in creating the walls of the city. Romulus kills Remus. And uh, how does this argument break out is that they're trying to get signs from the gods to get the okay for founding a city. Romulus goes to the Palatine Hill. Remus goes to the uh, uh, Aventine Hill. And ultimately, they can't agree upon how to interpret the signs from the gods. Remus sees the birds in the sky first sent from Jupiter, but Romulus sees more. So that's the kind of story that the, Rom the Romans are telling. A fight breaks out, and of course, with uh, identical twins, it's survival of the fittest, and the one that wins is Romulus. So that's another way of you know, natural selection to say, our founder is the better, the stronger of the two uh, twins and you found a city, you create a magical boundary around the city, you build walls. The ritual boundary is called a pomerium, that kind of magical boundary, where basically you uh, have a plow and you create a furrow around the outline of what your city will be. And in the life of Romulus, you have the rape of the Sabine women. You're stealing away the girls from the hill next door to the Palatine Hill, it's the Quirinal Hill. This is depicted here on a coin in the Republican period. And the punishment of Tarpeia, who betrays the state. She is buried alive by the shields of the Sabines that she was aligning herself with. So the Sabines, upset about the stealing away of their daughters, go to war against the Romans. And at a certain point, they're besieging the Romans on the Capitoline Hill. And Tarpeia betrays the state and lets them sneak in through the back door. And even they, the Sabines themselves, are disappointed with this treachery and kill her by burying her alive in their own shields and weaponry. So these are the kinds of stories that the Romans are telling, the way in which you go out and find a girl, the way in which you have to be aware of women because they can be treacherous in Tarpeia as the quintessential Benedict Arnold for the Romans. So they're finding not just stories uh, in the oral tradition to uh, say, this is where we came from. We were a bunch of ragtag people joining together with other villages, stealing away girls from uh, our neighbors, but also we had values, okay? And one of them is the state comes first and never betray the state. And so these are the kind of stories that you tell your kid at, at bedtime. Um, of course, you're building your walls it's uh, very labor intensive. All the citizens are participating. This is another rare uh, example of that. Quite uh, probably in this case here, not the city walls of Rome itself, but something pretty early. It's from that painted tomb also found today in Palazzo Massimo. Okay, some key concepts is with all of these stories, religio is the proper way to venerate the gods, superstitio, Sounds like superstition. It's the fearful way of venerating and worshiping the gods. It's wrong. But of course, we are going to be superstitious ourselves today and antiquity as well. Sometimes people behave and worship in the wrong way. So they always want to define that do it right, venerate the gods in a proper way. Follow the uh, traditions of your ancestors, the most maiorum. Keep that. Um, sacred bond and uh, association with the gods in a proper way, keep the Pax Deorum, so keep the peace of the gods with you. Be venerable, you know, show your respect to the gods, the pietas, the piety, and in particular in warfare, 
what you do is authorized. How many times does somebody, uh, even today, we look at our society, declaring war somewhere? Of course, you're always saying, I declare war on you because it's the right thing, it's the just thing, God bless the United States, and so on and so forth. So think about the ways in which states today, countries say, what we're doing is justified, what we're doing is right, and you know we have God on our side. The Romans took that same kind of attitude and had hundreds and hundreds of years through oral tradition before they're writing it down to essentially certify that their way was the right way because they were winning in their encounters by and large. So it means, of course, the gods were on their side. Uh, and then ultimately, I give to the gods, they give to me. Do ut des. So we know that we can't oblige the gods uh, to do our bidding, but we're going to make a good pact, a good contract we're going to make the proper sacrifices. We're going to adhere to tradition of our ancestors, and therefore the gods will be on our side. So we have some uh, really awesome images from various sources, Pompeii, the Arapacus, from an altar in uh, Carthage, but it's showing Aeneas. So Aeneas is ultimately the quintessential pious man for the Romans. He escapes the destruction of Troy, bottom left, bottom right, Carrying his old father, who's carrying a box with the household gods, carrying, well, taking the hand of his son and Kaisi. So three generations, a quintessential kind of uh, image. If you read Virgil's Aeneas, you'll see very quickly he loses his wife as he is, as he is uh, escaping the destruction of Troy. He has to find another wife and so on and so forth. Uh, but, uh, you know, so the Romans have their own uh, priorities in these stories. They wouldn't go down very well in today's society. Um, but for, uh, for this discussion, it's just good to look at Aeneas in the context of these big terms, religio, superstitio, pietas, peace of the gods, the tradition of our ancestors, and ultimately it's contractual. I give something to you, I make a sacrifice, as Aeneas is doing here on the Arapacus in the large image, so that you give something to me. Okay, some specific Roman myths uh, as we do a little uh, review then. Um, the Romans, as we're reading about them, really the texts go back to the second century BC, uh, heavily influenced by Greek texts, Greek uh, comedies, Greek historians. I mean, they're really setting a template for them. They tap into the Greek cycle. And ultimately, there are lots of people writing about the Romans before the Romans, before the Romans are writing their histories themselves, uh, mostly in Greek. And some people say the Romans are descended from Hercules. Some people say they're descended from Odysseus. The Romans themselves ultimately chose to canonize the version that they were descended from the Trojans, that in the uh, Trojan War cycle, uh, there were a number of people that escaped the destruction, including Aeneas, and that was the ultimate kind of ancestor, the primordial Roman then. Uh, that gets immortalized in Virgil's uh, Aeneid. That's what that's all about. So it's essentially half uh, Iliad and half Odyssey. So that's what Virgil constructed. It took those two big famous works, epic poems by Homer, and made them into one large epic Roman poem. And, uh, and then, of course, even the, a lot of the uh, noble families, the older families, the wealthier families, said they themselves were also descended from the gods. Even Julius Caesar said, we're descended from Aphrodite, Aeneas, and so forth. And that ultimately worked out beautifully because there were a lot of different ideas all the way through into the late Republic, who were the Romans descended from. And coincidentally, then the story that wins out and is canonized and promoted is going to be that of the Julian gangs, the Julian family. But it wasn't a guarantee because when Mark Antony went against Octavian, Mark Antony's was, his family was descended from Hercules. So just think if Mark Antony had defeated Octavian at the Battle of Actium, maybe the whole canon would have changed, would have shifted, would have been different to include then how the Romans were actually descended from Hercules because of the victory of Mark Antony. But that was not to be. So just to give you an idea of how these things can work out, here we have some colored images uh, from the panels on the Arapacus. It's hypothetical, and so we don't know the exact coloration, 
but definitely these panels, as were Roman and Greek statues once painted. Okay, so what about the Roman gods? Okay, so they're not just copying what the uh, Greeks have. They do things in their own way. They have their own traditions. And then, of course, they find uh, a synergy with, they find an overlap with, they find a one-on-one -on -one correspondence with sometimes with other gods, not just the Greeks, but the Etruscans, the Volscians, the Peliscans, uh, the Samnites, and so forth. Uh, so some famous Roman gods, the Capitoline Triad. There you have that image on the right of Marcus Aurelius making a sacrifice in front of the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, last beautifully built by the emperor Domitian uh, at the end of the first century AD. You think about the Pantheon temple, which includes statues of all the gods or a lot of the gods, including Divus Julius. Divine Julius Caesar becomes a god in a... Uh, in a strange way, he's assassinated, but then he's uh, deified by his successors. And when that deification process is going forward, Halley's Comet passes by, which is interpreted as his soul ascending into heaven. There are agricultural deities, like Pales, <clears throat> that we associate with the Palatine Hill, and the birthday of Rome is her festival, April 21st. That's a deity that doesn't exist in the Greek world, for example. Robigo is the god that wards off the must that will spoil your grain that you have in storage. So you pray to Robigo, you pray to Pales to help when you clean out the stalls in the spring. Um, so lots of different concepts with not much mythology, but ultimately with the Augustan age and with a greater interest in that material, poems are created, stories are made up, and there are lots of different interpretations that are floating through the, the pages of the poets like Propertius and Ovid. Romans also worship a lot of ideas and concepts, peace, piety, excellence, concord, the mind. Okay, so there are many, many ideas floating around in uh, the uh, Greek world that don't have a correspondence in the Roman world. And a lot of these figures don't even have their own mythology. So, so we have a lot of complex ideas floating around here in Roman religion and Roman mythology is a part really for the Romans in the creation, the, the, the creation myth of their people, of the foundation of the city and values that are given uh, to the Romans through different episodes. But a lot of the other deities like we're looking at agricultural deities and concept deities don't have a mythology at all. So what's truly Roman? Well, it really comes down to the end of the first century BC. There's a real great interest, antiquarian interest on the part of a lot of famous authors, Varro, Cicero, and then a lot of poets, Virgil, Ovid. Ovid's got this great poem. We only have half of it, but he covers six of the 12 months before he's exiled. And uh, he'll run through his ideas, his interpretations, um, records of interpretations of these myths. So he, he's a critical, critical uh, source that we have. And of course, we also have rites recorded in calendars. Here's the marble calendar that we find in Palazzo Massimo. It's the best preserved calendar from the ancient Roman world. Look at all that detail. Vin refers to Vinalia, the wine festival. Rob uh, refers to the Robigalia, the festival uh, when you're venerating the god that wards off the must that will mold your, your grain. So a lot of the agricultural um, interest of primordial Rome, let's say, before it becomes an urban center are still recalled and still part of tradition. Probably for most people that are no longer farmers, you know, because they're living in the city, they become creatures of the city, the first great city uh, uh, of that scale of a million people that the Mediterranean had ever seen. Okay, so obviously there are lots of outside influence, outside gods. So you come across them in the colonies in Southern Italy, uh, with the Etruscans just north of you, and through conquest, bringing slaves, bringing spoils of war, bringing in ideas. So a lot of that mythology is then incorporated into the Roman mythology. So at a certain point, who was Apollo? He's already in Rome in the fifth century, warding off a plague. Uh, so, you know, you have different ways in which a deity from another culture, another part of the world is helping you 
and it's in becoming one of your gods. So ultimately the Romans will boast that they have more gods in their city, more temples, more shrines than any other city. Hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of, of different cults and shrines in the city of Rome. Okay, finally, why Roman topography actually matters. So they ritualized the space that they lived in. Here are some famous examples in the Roman Forum. The Lacus Curtius is a spring. Bottom left-hand corner is the man sacrificing himself into a gaping hole. And when he closes it up by sacrificing his life, there's a spring that's, that's left behind. So self-sacrifice on behalf of the state gives you something that benefits the state. A spring of water, a natural spring in the Roman form. Same thing goes for the Lacus Uturna. It's another spring. And who comes there? Castor and Pollux, Greek gods announcing the victory of the Romans in the fifth century BC. And as a result, what do you do? You build them a temple. So there's a Trojanic version of the spring with water still in it, top right corner. And some Republican versions, statues of horses and the two gods that visited on the top left image. So there are many, many ways then in which the places of epiphany where magical events happen, supernatural events happen, gods appeared, they get immortalized and they become part of the mythology and the stories of Rome. Okay, the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus on the Capitoline Hill. Talked a little bit about Tarpeia. The Sabines are attacking the well, there weren't temples back in the day, but on the hill uh, of the Capitoline Hill, which has here in this image, the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Tarpeia betrays the state. She's put to death by the Sabines themselves. And as a result, the whole hill is oftentimes referred to as the Tarpeian Rock. And it's from one corner overlooking the prison in the Roman form that a lot of people were executed. They literally threw them off the uh, side of the hill about 40 meters high to their death. Uh, so that's, again, just to remind you about do not betray the state, betray the state, capital punishment. Terminus, uh, when you're digging the foundations of the first version of the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, one little shrine in particular that was supposed to be moved away when the area is being bulldozed over, refused to move. So that shrine was kept and incorporated into the temple. So that's a, been a place of uh, making treaties and, you know, basically, ultimately, the idea is the Romans don't budge, right? They will not give an inch and referring then to this cult of Terminus that didn't even make way for Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Manlius and the geese, a soldier woken up by geese that are honking in the temple of Juno on the Capitoline Hill during the Gallic siege of 390, essentially saved Rome from total obliteration and annihilation. So you have time and time again, these stories that are told, the myths for the Romans have a lesson, have a moral. And, uh, and ultimately it's for the protection of the state, it's the interest of the state, the state comes first and so forth. And of course there are standout people like Manlius as a hero, but he's a hero through the fact that the gods intervened and uh, activated the geese. The geese honked, honked, honk, made a lot of noise uh, when the Gauls were trying to scale the walls and ultimately saved Rome, saved the uh, citadel. And as a result, when you remember that infamous day, you crucify dogs because the dogs did not bark. The geese are paraded around, the dogs are crucified because they did not do their jobs. Okay, that's the kind of story that we're, we, we, we read about that are told by the Romans and they, they sound pretty awful. But uh, you can understand what the tradition is coming from. This was a day that lived on in infamy for the Romans for 800 years. Circus Maximus, that's where the rape of the Sabine women took place. Uh, there were also religious events. Altar of Consus is there. So you're actually having a, um, an agricultural uh, veneration of a deity associated with the harvest. And in that moment of celebration, that's when you steal away the Sabine women. It ultimately becomes a place of chariot racing that we all know. And, um, and ultimately the gods are brought in, their statues, their idols are brought in for the Ludi Romani, the Roman games, but it's all associated around the fact that it was here, a real physical location that Romulus started the general population of Rome. There were a bunch of guys, there were no women, this is where the family got its start. 
The Campus Martius uh, is a place of uh, epiphany as well. It's one of the two places besides the Forum where Ramesh reportedly ascends into heaven and becomes a god, somewhere near the altar of Mars, which is shown on this map in the bottom right-hand corner in a very crowded imperial city. But ultimately, we don't know where the altar of Mars was located. Some people want to put it near the Pantheon itself. So throughout the city, you went and you say, oh, that God appeared here. Oh, this miracle happened here. Lightning struck here and so forth. So these are the stories that you're telling, giving values uh, to your kids uh, and, and trying to bring them up as uh, proper Romans that are focused on the importance of the state. Form Boarium, Hercules himself pops by and, um, and, uh, and as a result, a lot of temples are built to him. Uh, this cult statue was found in one uh, temple of Hercules, and the bottom one is another uh, temple of Hercules still standing because it becomes a church. But the reason why there's a concentration of uh, Hercules in that area, it's the cattle market. He came by with his cattle on one of his labors on his way back to Greece from Spain. So you're tying in real physical place, real commercial activities, with a god who's associated with that commerce and a god is associated with cattle. Uh, Portunus is the god of the port, it's next door, but essentially it is again, having real physical space with real appearance of a deity. And as a result, uh, Hercules gets temples and he gets the Ara Maxima, the greatest altar, a large mega altar uh, for sacrificing multiple heads of cattle simultaneously right there along the riverbanks right there by the Circus Maximus.